Do you have a robot vacuum cleaner at home? I do, and I wish it had an arm, and that arm would be able to pick up all the socks and toys from the floor so that I wouldn't have to do that. I actually wish it was a bit taller and had maybe two arms and empty the dishwasher and fold the laundry and do the dusting. So, well, maybe that's how our future will look like. Maybe one day we will have robot butlers at our home instead of those robot vacuum cleaners. A robot butler would bring a convenience to many people like me. I wouldn't have to do all the things that I don't like doing. For some people, a robot butler would be a life-changing thing for people who need assistance in their everyday life. Self-driving vehicles would bring convenience to many people like me, but for some people, a self-driving car would be a life-changing thing. This is what I see in robots and in autonomous systems. I see the enormous potential they have to change our lives. But as a researcher and an engineer, I see this. I see all the sensors that make the robot see and hear and feel. I see the cameras, the microphones, the four-stroke sensors. I see the actuators that make the robot move. I see all the end effectors that make it interact with its physical environment. I see the wheels and the arms and the fingers. I see all the little components that it's built from. I see the neural network that's behind perception that takes that sensory input and turns it into an understanding of our world. I see how that understanding can be translated into robots' actions through algorithms. The thousands and thousands lines of code that take that algorithm and turn it into execution. I see the beautiful math behind the robot. My job is not to touch the microphone. <laughs> My job is also to make sure that uh, the robots are safe. That they behave safely around people, that they don't harm people, that they don't harm themselves, that they serve to their purpose. And for that, I'm using various mathematical tools. I'm developing them and I'm using them. For example, uh, I work with logic. So logic can give us rigorous and precise description of what we want from a robot. I can say that my robot butler should every day vacuum clean the apartment as soon as everyone leaves for work. I can express in logic that the robot butler should go around and grab all the dirty dishes and bring it to kitchen and load the dishwasher. I can also say that once the battery is below 10% of its capacity, the robot butler should go and plug itself into the charger and that that has higher priority than all the other tasks. With logic, I can also express road rules, traffic rules. I can say, that a self-driving vehicle should follow the road rules, should stay in the left lane or the right lane, depending on which country you are at. Uh, that it should actually keep safe distance to the car in front of it. And that distance is something like it should be able to break within three seconds without colliding. So logic gives me a way to describe what I want from a robot. And then I have another tool, formal synthesis, that takes that logical description and turns it into a correct by design plan. A sequence of actions that the robot should execute. And now the beauty of, of formal synthesis is that if I tomorrow decide that my robot butler should be doing something else, I don't need to reprogram the robot. I just change the logical description of what the robot should be doing. Now, once I have the sequence of actions that the robot should execute, I need to make sure that those actions are executed safely, that the robot does not collide with anything. And for that, we have other mathematical tools. We have something that is called control barrier functions. So they really work as a barrier, as an invisible fence. What you see is one of my students proactively 
trying to teleoperate this little drone into a chair. The control barrel function doesn't let him do that. It works as an invisible fence and it gives us a provable guarantee that the collision will be avoided. Now, safety is not only about collision avoidance. It is also about protecting the robot from, from itself. So cutting a zucchini is something that all of you can do seamlessly. For a robot, that's not such an easy task. A robot trying to cut through zucchini can get stuck. The knife can get stuck and the robot can overheat. It can get into an emergency shutdown. And again, we have various mathematical tools that help us to come to this point where it cuts without overheating. So all of these things, logic, formal synthesis, controlled barrier functions, and other mathematical tools, they give us guarantees that the system works as we expect. The power is in the mathematical rigor. It's in the theorems and the proofs that give us understanding of what works, why it works, under what circumstances it works. So am I saying that we got you covered and that we have all figured it out and that you can trust our robots unconditionally because everything is now equipped with these guarantees? I'm not saying that at all. Robots are not perfect, just as people are not perfect. You happen to bump into each other when going in the streets because you don't see behind the corner, because you don't predict the intentions of the other people in the street correctly because you are not able to react as fast in the, in the situation, because you maybe don't estimate the distances precisely. And robots have the very, very same issues. They need to process a lot of information in very short amount of time, and the world is so uncertain. The robots don't see behind the corner. They have advanced prediction algorithms, but they still make mistakes because people are so unpredictable. They need to estimate where they are in the world from measurements of their sensors, and those measurements are imprecise. Those estimations are imprecise. Robots don't know where they are precisely. They have to process a lot of information in computation. That takes a bit of time, and before they figure out what they should do, the moment has passed. It's too late. Now, all the tools that I told you about, the logic, the formal synthesis, the control barrier functions, they still help us. They still help us to understand how much we can trust the robot, how much um, guarantees we can get. Those guarantees are not going to be 100%. They're going to be more like quantification of risk or conditional guarantees or some understanding that enhances trustworthiness. Now, the tricky part is that trans trustworthiness from this engineering perspective, the proofs and all these things, um, they have very little to do how much people actually trust robots, how they behave around them and what they do. So sometimes we pe see people over trusting robots. Sometimes we see people under trusting robots. Sometimes we see them comfortable. Sometimes we see them extremely uncomfortable. My two-year-old daughter always runs away from the robot vacuum cleaner whenever it's on. And she also keeps a proper distance when it's off and parked. When first robots were deployed in museums and in um, hospitals and airports, we saw people doing all sorts of things around. They were quite not sure whether to get out of the way or whether they should just continue with their business. We saw people being brave around the robots and curious. We saw them touching the robot, poking them, kicking them. We saw people jumping right in front of the robot to see whether the robot would stop or not. We saw all of these things. So what is that that influences how people perceive robots, how they trust them, how they behave around them? What are those, those things? 
And the super simple answer is that it's almost everything. Um, let me tell you about the study that we ran with my colleagues at KTH. So imagine that you are walking down the corridor and there is a robot approaching you, going on the very same trajectory, just in the opposite direction. Hmm? So if, you, if one of you don't change their trajectory, if one of you doesn't swerve, you are going to bump into each other. So who should swerve? Who should make that move? Is it you or should the robot be intelligent and agile and get out of your way? If you swerve, do you swerve right away when you see the robot or do you wait a little bit till it approaches to maybe see if it starts the swerving maneuver? How long do you wait? So we try to uh, um, explore how people behave in this human robot encounter. And we developed an online study. It's like a little computer game. Um, there is a human avatar controlled by a human participant. And there is a robot, uh, incoming robot, that uh, is controlled by a computer program. The robot is equipped with just basic motion planning algorithm. It goes from A to B, and it has some collision avoidance not to bump into the person that is more or less effective. Now, we told half of the participants that the robot is actually controlled by a human person, by another human, so we lied. And we told the other half of the participants that the robot is controlled by artificial intelligence. You know what, what came out? People actually behaved more politely when they thought there is another person on the other end. They would swerve earlier and they would let go to the other person because they thought it's a person. Then we tried another thing. We took the robot and we actually implemented two different visual appearances. So the size of the robot stayed approximately the same, but in one case, the robot was more looking like a machine. And in the other case, the robot was more looking like a person. What it turned out is that people would expect more human-like behavior from a more human-like looking robot, even though what was inside was the exact same thing, and even though on the outside, they were exhibiting the exactly same behavior. And then we t played a little bit with motivation. We told people that the robot is in a hurry, that it's in a rush. What happened is that people started giving way to the robot a little bit more and let the, go, uh, the robot go more straight so that the robot that is in hurry could, could pass. But when we told people that they are in rush and the robot is not, they would not change significantly how they behave. In simulations, when we came with this study to the lab, what happened is that people reacted even if they were in rush themselves. So a person in a lab with a real robot, if they were in a rush, they would go more, more straight than they would in simulations. So there is a difference between whether you're interacting with a simulated agent or whether you're interacting with a real robot. A lot of things mattered. Almost everything mattered. The appearance, the agency, the motivation. Now, this study actually allowed us to collect quite a bit of data about how people move around robots. We took the data set, we used logical inference algorithms to come up with logical dis descriptions of typical human trajectories around robots. And we tried to implement that into our motion planning algorithm instead of the usual collision avoidance. And then we brought this in the lab. We brought the usual collision avoidance and we brought the human-like trajectory onto a robot in the lab. And what we found out is that people would perceive the robot that tries to replicate what a human would do as more intelligent and most, more socially compliant. But what was really interesting is that they did not perceive the robot as safer. 
So the lesson learned for me for the, from this was that we need to think about both perspective on, tr on trustworthiness. We need to think about the engineering perspective and we need to think about the human perspective. We need to align them and we need to combine them. As much as we need those rigorous mathematical tools, we need social sciences to help us understand how to design robots that people trust just to the extent that they should be trusted. Thank you very much.